Chapter 6 The Night of the Dancing Dead Drakenhof, Early Winter, 2010 It had been a hard year for John Skellen. Failure weighed heavily on him. The agony of dead ends and false hopes were etched now in every crease and wrinkle of the witch hunter's face. His eyes betrayed the depth of his suffering. John Skellen was a haunted man. His ghosts were not the kindly spirit come to shape his future. They were bitter revenants that came tearing up from his past with hate enough to turn any heart black. Wearing the guises of loved ones, they taunted him with his failure. They threw it in his face, branding him useless, their accusations dripped with a venom of self-loathing because, after all, that was exactly what the ghosts he carried with him were. Projections of his own self-loathing, his own bitterness, his own hatred. It was Skellen who couldn't bear to look at himself in the mirror any more. He knew that, and yet he still let them get to him. He obsessed on one unassailable fact. Sebastian Aigner was still out there, still alive. The murderer's continued existence taunted Skellen day and night. It was as though the pair were locked in some perverse game of cat and mouse, that was being played on the streets of Drakenhof. Several times since their arrival in the city, Skellen and Fisher had come within a whisker of confronting Aigner, Aigner having moved on mere minutes before their arrival. They were close enough they could smell the man's rank body odor in the musty air of the taverns and gambling dens, only for them to be left scratching their heads with the murderer having seemingly vanished into thin air by the time they made it back out onto the street. A long time ago, Skellen had reached the only reasonable conclusion he could, that some very powerful people were shielding his wife's murderer. It wasn't a pleasant thought. It made him doubt what he could trust, made him spurn help where it was offered, and made him turn on those who offered friendship. So he stayed, and he waited, forcing himself to find patience where there was only the desperate need for resolution and restitution. He listened to the stories surfacing almost daily. First, it was tales of the wasting sickness ravaging the Sylvanian aristocracy, and the tragic accidents that befell those who sought to oppose the rule of Vlad von Karstein. And then it was the anti-Sigmarite outbreaks that saw more and more of the old temples defiled. More and more of the whisperers offered their own copper coins worth of wisdom along with the rumors. Every third or fourth gossip fastened on the cult of the risen dead, and how they were not so slowly removing all traces of Sigmar from the Sylvanian countryside. Some could not hide their glee at the return to the older faiths, others remained more skeptical, sensing that there was more to this religious purge than simply some resurgence of the old ways, and pointed to the name chosen by the cult, the risen dead. It played on centuries of fear, something the peasantry were all too familiar with. Perhaps the most telling gossip revolve around the miraculous recovery of the Count's wife Isabella, and the fact that, unsurprisingly, she was a changed woman after the sickness, forever wan and pale. The gossips spoke about how she never left the chambers she shared with her husband, save by night. Even now, almost a year on, Skellen remembered well the clandestine meeting he and Fisher had with Victor Schliemann, one of the two physicians who had attended the countess during her prolonged illness. The man had been terrified, always casting glances back over his shoulder, as though afraid of who might hear the conversation. The most memorable thing about the meeting, though, was the fact that Schliemann was adamant that Isabella von Karstein's heart had stopped, that she was in fact dead when he left the room. That was immediately before the count had called the physicians fakes and dismissed them from his service. Schliemann had been brutally murdered the morning after the meeting with Skellen. Skellen had no fondness for coincidences. It was obvious that Schliemann had paid the highest price for his loose tongue. Someone had wanted him silenced, which only went to convince Skellen that he had been telling the truth, that Isabella von Karstein had died and has been resuscitated. It was no wonder that she had become so important to the followers of the risen dead. She was one of them. She had crossed over to the other side. She had breathed the fetid air of Moore's underworld, and yet she was back, walking amongst them once more, pale-faced and afraid of sunlight. She was a creature of the night, a human owl. 
the old temples destroyed, the dead risen, the nobles falling victim to the same peculiar wasting sickness that meant that the castles across the land had become home to sallow-skinned nocturnal folk. These rumors all pointed to the same fundamental truth, that there was something rotten in the province of Sylvania. Skellon made the sign of the hammer reflexively, and gazed up at the specter of the Count's Gothic castle perched like some bird of prey on the mountainside. All sharp edges and jagged black towers, with their blind windows staring back down at him. The castle was like nothing he had ever seen, teetering there on the sheer face of the rock. The bird of prey analogue was a good one, Skellon thought wryly, though it could easily have been some misshapen gargoyle perched up there instead. With money running low, they had had a small stroke of good fortune, and taken to lodging with Klaus Hollenfuhr, a wine merchant, in one of the less run-down parts of the city. Hollenfuhr was a good man, sympathetic to their quest for justice. He could have charged them an arm and a leg for the spacious room above his wine cellar, but instead of taking money, he had them work off the rent, running the occasional delivery, but more often, but more often than not, simply guarding his stock. Holland Fuhrer didn't need them. He had a small legion of guards on his payroll, and there were plenty of boys in the city who could have run the errands. They both knew that Holland Fuhrer kept them around because he felt sorry for them. The merchant had lost his own wife and daughter to bandits on the road to Wahaldenschlosse a few years earlier. Part of him, he confessed one drunken evening over half-empty glasses, envied Skellen and Fisher for the relentless pursuit of Aigner and his murderous band of brothers, and wished he had the guts to do the same to Boris Eareater and his filthy horde of bandit scum. The three of them were in the same attic, above the wine cellar of Kaufmannstrasse. Skellen, his back to the other men, stared intently out of the small round window. A low-lying fog had begun to settle in. It masked the city streets with a real pea-super thickness that made it difficult for him to see more than a few feet where he looked down at the streets below. Looking upwards, though, towards the castle, the air was still bright and clear. The fog, however, was rising. In a few hours, it would shroud the castle as completely as it already did the city streets. He couldn't have wished for better weather for what he had in mind. It was the perfect cloak for the subterfuge he was hoping to employ. A steady procession of coaches and carts carrying the rich and the beautiful had been making their way up to the curving road toward the black castle's lowered drawbridge all day. From the distance, the gateway looked like a huge gaping maw waiting to swallow them. Totentans, quite literally, the dance of death, or at least a masquerade in honor of the departed, marked the eve of Geheimnisnacht. Vlad von Karstein had seen to it that absolutely anyone who was anyone would be under his roof to see in Geheimnisnacht. Many of the coach's passengers had traveled from the furthest reaches of the province to pay tribute to the Count and his beloved Isabella, and the process witnessed the unveiling of the artist Gemein Gist's portrait of the Countess. That Gist, an old man deep in his final years, had undoubtedly created one final masterpiece, and that was cause for jubilation. Gist hadn't accepted the commission in over a decade, and many thought the old man would never hold a brush again until he was creating art for more in the halls of the dead. It was no small marvel that the Count had somehow coaxed the man into doing one final portrait, but then the Count was persuasive. Drakenhof had been alive with talk of Tottentons for weeks. Seamstresses and tailors worked their fingers to the bone, hurrying to create gowns to rival the beauty of their wearers. The vintners and dairy farmers created and casked up the finest of their wares, delivering them up to the castle, the bakers and butchers prepared fresh meat and delicacies to make the mouth water. It seemed as though everyone had a part to play in the masked ball apart from Skellon and Fisher. Are you absolutely sure you can't be talked out of this? Fisher asked, knowing that his friend had well and truly made his mind up, and there was nothing he could do about it. He didn't like it, and he had been making his unhappiness plain ever since Skellon shared his plan, but the only thing to do now was to go along with it. Ride the wave and see where it took them. Certain, Skellon said, scratching his nose. It was something he did when he was nervous and didn't know what to do with his hands. He's up there, my friend. I know it. You know it. Can't you feel it? I can. It's in the air itself. So thick you can almost touch it. It's alive. It feels as though there is some kind of charge, a frisson. If I close my eyes, 
I can feel it seep into my skin and cause my heart to hammer. It makes my blood sing in my veins. And I know what it means. He's close. So close. Here's my promise. It ends tonight. After eight long years, one of us will meet more face to face. Can you promise me it won't be you? No, Skellon said honestly. But believe me, if I go, I will do my damnedest to take the murdering horse on with me. Good luck to you, lad, Holland Fuhrer said, coming up behind him to rest a hand on his shoulder. It's a brave thing you are doing tonight, walking into that beast's lair. May your God guide your sword. Thank you, Klaus. All right, let's go over this again, shall we? Skellon turned away from the window. This final delivery is little more than an hour, thirteen casks of various wines. Two will be marked as Bretonian. Those are the ones Fisher and I will be hiding in. Your man is waiting at the other end to uncork us, so to speak. A third cask, marked with the seal of Hochland, will contain our swords and twin handheld double-shot crossbows, along with eight bolts in two smell-belted sheets. The weapons will be wrapped in oilskins and floating in the actual wine. We've been over this a thousand times, my friend, the merchant said placatingly. Henrik is already up at the castle unloading an earlier shipment. Your weapons are wrapped and ready to hide in the barrel. The last cart is loaded. All that remains for you is to go downstairs and wait for me to seal you in an empty cask of Bretonian wine. The journey to the castle will take an hour, perhaps a little more. Worry about what you will do once you are inside the castle. Let me worry about getting you in there. I'm still not entirely happy about this, Fisher said. I've got a bad feeling. It just keeps niggling away at the back of my mind, and it won't go away. That's your old woman instinct, Skellen said, with an exaggerated wink at Holland Fjord. You know it is rather overdeveloped. When this is all over, you'll make a wonderful harridan of shrew, my friend. The merchant didn't laugh in part because he shared Fisher's misgivings, but he wasn't about to voice his concerns. So what say we get on to work, lads? Aye, the day isn't getting any younger, Skellen said. The three men went down four flights of stairs to the cellar, where the dray had already been loaded, the two cart horses harnessed and ready to roll. The barrels on the flatbed were various sizes, and showed different signs of age and wear. A few of them were a dark wet brown and branded with the maker's mark, while the others were made of pale dry wood. The two Bretonian casks were barely big enough for them to squeeze into. Holland Fewer had reasoned that the smaller casks would be less suspicious than the larger beer barrels, though if an over-enthusiastic guard decided to help unload a cart, he would be in for a hefty surprise. Skellon climbed into one of the barrels, drawing his knees up tight to his chin and lowering his head. Holland Fewer pressed the lid down and hammered the seal into place. He had drilled two small air holes just beneath the second metal band, chinching the barrel's girth somewhere near where to stowaway's face ought to be, but they were so small they would let precious little air into the suffocating confines of the barrel. They were big enough to keep him alive, though. It was dark and claustrophobically uncomfortable. An hour in there was going to be nothing short of hellish. After a few minutes he heard the banging of Fisher's cask being secured and then the third lid being nailed shut on their weapons. One weapon didn't make it into the third cask. Skellen wore it on a leather thong around his neck. The glass file cold against his skin as he cradled it close to his chest. It had cost him almost all of the money he had, but if it helped Aigner burn, it would be worth every last coin of it. And then they were moving. The slow, gentle sway of the cart quickly became nauseating. Skellen tried to clear his mind of all thoughts, but they kept coming back to the same thing. The face of the man he intended to kill. Sebastian Aigner. The cask muffled the sounds of the world. It was impossible to tell where they were along the road. He caught occasional snatches of Holland Fuhrer whistling. The man couldn't carry a tune to save his life. Every few minutes, the sweat pulling in the hollows of his collar and the base of his spine and behind his knees, Skellen twisted around to suck in a few precious mouthfuls of fresh air. The inside of the cask was choked with the bouquet of rancid wine. Several times he had to fight back the urge to gag. Before long, he found himself getting dizzy on the intoxicating fumes. The cart jounced and juddered 
on the roughshod road, bouncing skeleton around in the dark, numbness like a thousand stabbing pins and needles seeped into his arms and legs as his blood stopped circulating properly. And then, after what felt like an eternity, he felt the car begin to slow and eventually came to a standstill. He could barely make out the strains of muffled conversation. He used his imagination to piece it together. The guard questioning the wine merchant, demanding his bill of lading, then satisfied, telling him where to leave the delivery using an unseen passage so as to avoid being seen by the steady stream of guests. Someone banged three times in rapid succession on the lid of Skellum's barrel. His heart stopped. He didn't dare breathe or move. Everything hung in the balance. It could be all over in the matter of a few seconds. Years in pursuit of justice come to nothing. He closed his eyes, waiting for the inevitable shaft of sunlight as the guard cracked open the lid of his hiding place. But it didn't come. The cart rumbled forward again. A shaky sigh leaked between his lips. They were inside the castle walls. They were rapidly approaching the critical moment, transferring the barrels from the cart into the count's cellars. If anything were going to go wrong, it would be in the next few minutes. Skellen sent a silent prayer to Sigmar. The barrel bumped sharply as the cart wheel rattled over a jagged stone, and for a moment all sensation of movement ceased. Then suddenly the barrels were being manhandled off the cart and rolled down planks into the cellar. Skellen caught himself on the brink of crying out. The shock of the violent disruption to his surroundings was both nauseating and agonizing, as his body slammed into the barrel's inner wall and squashed his face up against the lid. As suddenly as it began, the turbulent spinning stopped, and a seal was being broken on the lid of his wooden prison. As the lid came off, Skellen arched his back and pushed upwards, desperate to get out of the claustrophobic barrel. Like a diver surfacing after too long beneath the surface, he gasped, gulping down the musty cellar air greedily. He retched, almost choking on the air. Hollerfuer's cellar boy Henrik hunched over the second Bretonian white cask. He wore a look of steady concentration on his face as he worked the tip of the metal crowbar between the seal and the wood and levered it loose. From inside, Fisher pushed up with both hands, forcing his way out of the barrel. Skellen's legs buckled as he tried to stand. He caught himself on the supporting strut of a peculiar wooden contraption that was halfway between a harness and a winch. He stood there for a long moment, shaking. Henrik helped Fisher stand. In a small rectangle of failing light at the top of the gangplanks leading out of the cellar, Hollenfuhr nodded once and banged the storm covers closed. Moments later, they heard the distinct crack of a whip and the creaks and groans of the cart making a slow circle before returning back to the wine cellar of Kaufmannstrasse. Skellen looked around the cellar. The cold stones were impregnated with years of damp and limbed with creeping black mold. Henrik handed them their weapons. Skellen sheathed his sword and clipped the handheld crossbow onto his belt. The extra bolts he slipped into a booth sheath. Beside him, Fisher did likewise. With his sword at his side, his sense of vulnerability subsided. He clapped his friend on the back. The ceiling was low enough to force Fisher to stoop. The bigger man moved awkwardly towards the door, leading up to the kitchens. No retreat, no surrender, Skellen said, taking a deep breath and following him. They paused at the door. Sounds of frantic activity filtered down to them. The hordes of kitchen staff were no doubt making madly to get everything perfect for the Count's feast. If we don't make it out of this, Fisher whispered, fear glistening in his dark eyes. What kind of existence would you choose in your next life? The same life I had once before in this one. An unknown farmer, living in an out-of-the-way corner of the empire. A good wife, happy. I would give anything to go back to that time. To be the man I was, not the man I became. Fisher nodded his understanding. I would like to go back to that day, he admitted. Though, I think I would choose to die with them second time around, rather than live like this. This time it was Kellen who nodded. Enough talking, my friend. Death awaits. So saying, he hefted a small cask of port wine onto his shoulder, and pushed open the door and walked confidently up the narrow servant's stairway. Fisher followed, two steps behind him. Skellen ignored the look of the kitchen staff, and walked straight up to the man who looked as though he was in charge. "'Where do you want it, squire?' he said, 
tapping the cask with his fingers. The cook turned up his nose and waved him away. Over there, with the others by the door. Then go get clean yourselves up. You're filthy, man. The Count will have your hide if he sees you like that, Skellon grunted and turned away. There were several small barrels, and one larger one stacked against the furthest wall. He put the cask down beside the others, and walked straight out of the kitchen door. The passageway divided into three, one four going left, another right, while the third continued straight on. Without knowing which way to go, he opted to go straight on for the sake of expediency. It would be easier to find his way back, if it proved to be the wrong choice. They moved quickly through the belly of the castle in search of a stairway leading up. It wasn't difficult to find one. Noise drew them towards the great hall. The passageways increased in richness, going from cold stone to tapestry-lined walls, with various depictions of hunting and reclined beauties, each passage opening into a wider one, until it finally opened into the great hall itself. The buzz turned into a roar of noise. The great hall was alive with a swarm of people, flitting from place to place, the buzz of conversation constant. All of the guests wore peculiar skull masks, making it appear as though they themselves had risen fresh from the grave. As Skellen and Fisher entered the hall, two young serving girls swooped down seemingly out of nowhere and pressed masks into their hands. Skellen took this gratefully and quickly covered his face. How in Sigmar's name are we going to find him if he's wearing a bloody mask? Fisher cursed behind him. The hall was already stiflingly hot, the air thick with humidity. Given the amount of people already present, it was hardly surprising. Skellen noticed more than a few ladies fanning themselves almost constantly, as they turned and turned about to survey the gatherings. The place was a riot of clashing colors. Beside the Count's obsidian throne, a row of violinists and cellists conjured a symphony of music. The third concerto of Adolphus, the blind Sigmarite monk, each note resonating with a pure unblemished simplicity that bordered on the divine. Skellen stopped in the middle of the press of people and let the music wash over him like a crashing wave. It was beautiful. There really was no other word to describe it. On the opposite side of the obsidian throne, a large day's hand had been constructed, and on it stood Gematin Gist's portrait of Isabella von Karstein, hidden beneath a plain scarlet curtain. There was a fluid grace to the way the guests moved around the floor, as though they were all part of some huge orchestrated dance. But where it aimed at sophistication, there was something decidedly more tribal and ritualistic about the whole performance. Skellen scanned the dizzying array of face masks, hoping to catch a glimpse of the people lurking behind the bone. Cold certainty settled in his gut. Aigner was among them. He knew it. One of those masks hid the man who murdered his wife. Skellen pushed deeper into the crowd. Fisher struggled to match his momentum. The music surged. Bodies swarmed and pressed on all sides. Skellen stared at mask after mask, a hideous dance of death being played out before his eyes. It was hopeless. To be so close, within touching distance at least once, almost certainly, and not being able to recognize his quarry, he clenched his fists. More than anything at that moment, he wanted to lash out with frustration. The tempo of the music shifted into something more melancholic. Skellen stood in the center of the great hall, looking left and right. And then he looked up, at the gallery overlooking the floor. A cadaverous young man braced himself on the mahogany balustrade, studying the dancers as though he were watching a swarm of flies crawling over the carcass of some long-dead animal. His distaste was obvious. Behind him were five men, two of whom were a striking resemblance to the Count himself, some sort of family, Skellen reasoned. The other three were muscle, ready to interject if things on the dance floor got out of hands, to a rowdy drink or an angry borderland baron making a scene. Skellen scanned the second gallery behind him. Again, it was lined with attentive spectators, all well-dressed but obviously guards. One wore twin blades in a curious double sheaf on his back. While the blades were interesting, it was the shaven head of the man beside the sword-bearer that stopped Skellen dead in his tracks. The years had not been kind to Sebastian Aigner. Far from it. In the eight years since he had ridden into Skellen's village with his murderous brethren, the man had aged twenty. He looked different, not just older. It was something about the way he held himself. He looked like a man resigned to his fate. That was it. 
Skelon had seen the look before in those he had condemned to a fiery death. The mask of damnation hung over Aynor's head. It was all John Skellon could do not to unclip the handheld crossbow at his side and bury a metal-tipped bolt in the man's throat there and then. He imagined himself doing it, raising the small crossbow slowly, squeezing down on the trigger mechanisms, and watching the deadly bolt punch into Aignor's throat, the momentary look of shock, bewilderment, before the blood pulsed out of the wound through his desperate fingers as he clutched at his throat trying to keep it back. An icy satisfaction settles like a smooth-sided stone in Skellon's gut. He tended here tonight. I see him, he said just loud enough for his words to carry to Fisher. Fisher turned and quickly scanned the gallery. He almost didn't recognize the man. His shaved head and the heavy crisscrossing of scars of his scalp made Ignor look very different. It's him, Fisher agreed. He looked around the great hall for a stairway that led up to the gallery, but there was nothing obvious. Several of the stone columns around the room were covered by thick velvet drapes, and magnificent tapestries hung from two of the four walls. Any one of them could have hidden a door or a staircase. Skellon pushed towards the edge of the great hall, his head swimming with thoughts of vengeance. Bodies closed around him, cutting him off from Fisher. He kept pushing forward, squeezing through gaps that weren't really there. The time signature of the music shifted again, into a heavy cantante, the violins replacing the voice of the singer as the music spiraled into a triumphant crescendo. In the second of awed silence that followed, a collective gasp escaped the lips of the milling dancers. The Count, Vlad von Karstein and his beautiful wife Isabella stepped through the oaken doors behind the obsidian throne. The man moved with predatory grace, the woman like his shadow. The pair were so perfectly in time with each other, the Count raised his wife's hand high, and bowed low to a ripple of applause. There was something about the man that set Skellon's skin crawling. It wasn't anything obvious. There was no mark of chaos hanging over him. It was subtle, but it was there. A faint, nagging something. In part, it could have been down to the arrogance with which the man carried himself, but that was not it, at least not all of it. He might not have been able to divine the cause, but the effect was plain to see. The party-goers viewed the count with awe. Death masks slipped down to reveal wide-eyed adoration. Vlad von Karstein owned these people body and soul. He had the mesmerist's draw on them. Skellon knew that von Karstein was no different from a great puppet master. Every one of the people in the hall would dance to his whim. The woman, on the other hand, was easy to read. There was a raw sexuality about her, and she knew it. A measured look here a slight smile there, a teasing touch, the tip of her tongue lingering just slightly too long on her fulsome lips, a toss of the head to accentuate the swan-like grace of her neck and the cascade of her dark hair as it spilled down her back. She played with them almost as well as her husband did, but where he carried a faint air of melancholy with him, she radiated the self-assurance of power, real power. The crowd parted to let them pass. Skellon used the distraction of von Karstein's arrival to slip away unnoticed. He glanced back over his shoulder. Toadying guests, all hungry to get close to the Count and his lady, fenced Fisher in. Skellon had no choice. He couldn't go back for him, and he couldn't risk waiting. The choices of a warrior were simple. In a difficult situation, press on. When surrounded, look for weakness in your enemy's strategy that can be exploited. When confronted with death, fight. He had no choice. Skellon left Fisher staring hopelessly at his back as he disappeared through the crowd. Behind him, Fisher tried to barge his way through the bodies, but the sheer weight of people pushed him back. Friends, von Karstein said, his voice cutting through the falling hubbub. Be welcome in my home, for today we celebrate the most fragile of things and the most finite, life, and revel in the infinite, death. We come together as faceless constructs, bare bones that make us indistinguishable from one another. In that, we are equal. There were a few murmurs of assent. Equal in life and equal in death. Tonight we throw our inhibitions to the wind and give ourselves over to the music of these fine players. We are blessed with wonderful food and wine brought in from the very finest corners of the province. So... I urge you to surrender to the spirit of Totentans. 
It is, after all, the dance of the dead. And who are we mere mortals to withstand such august company? Raise a glass to the restless dead, my friends, to the ghosts, the shades, the ghouls, the wraiths, the whites, the banshees, the liches, the mummies, the nightmares, the wares, the shadows, the zombies, the specters, the phantasms, and of course, he slowed down, letting his voice sing to the merest whisper. The Count didn't need to shout. His voice carried to each and every guest, raising goose pimples of anticipation along their flesh. The vampires! A burst of applause greeted von Karstein's toast. Cries of, To the dead! echoed around the room. Skellen reached the first of four red velvet curtains bearing the crest of Sylvania. One of them, he hoped, would reveal a short flight of stairs leading up to the gallery. He paused to look up at Aigner. The man appeared almost bored by the proceedings. Aigner leaned on the mahogany balustrade, clenching and unclenching his fists. Beside him, more of von Karstein's cronies were chuckling. Skellen pushed aside the curtain. As he had suspected, the red cloth hid the passageway. This one led off deeper into the castle, but there was no sign of a staircase leading up to the gallery so he let the curtain fall closed again. The second curtain hid a barred door. The third opened on to another passage that disappeared into the darkness of Drakenhof's lower levels. He slipped behind the final curtain and into a tight embrasure that turned into an even tighter staircase. The music started up again behind him. Skellen climbed the stairs. Countless thoughts chased through his head like blind runners stumbling across each other. He couldn't think straight. It didn't matter. He didn't need to. His hands trembled with anticipation as he pulled a leather thong over his head. The glass file was all that he needed. He was glad Fisher had become trapped with the surging crowd. He hadn't been entirely truthful. He knew the risks coming here. He was going to kill Igner in front of hundreds of people. He didn't expect to walk out of Drakenhof. It didn't matter. All that mattered was that Lisbeth was finally avenged that the circle of violence closed here tonight. Death had long since ceased to frighten him, after all. What was there left to be afraid of? Lisbeth would be waiting for him in the kingdom of Moor. They would be together again. In that, von Karstein had been right when he said death was cause for celebration. He paused before he stepped out onto the gallery. The violins rose in shrieking chorus, masking the sound of his footsteps. There were four men on the gallery with Aigner. Skellen didn't care. He only had eyes for Aigner. The others were insignificant. His fist closed around the glass file. One of the others, the shortest of the four, turned and saw him. A look of distaste spread across the man's face. Downstairs. You ain't allowed up here. I go where I please, Skellen said. Aigner turned at the sound of his voice. For a moment, Skellen fancied he saw a glimmer of recognition in the murderer's eyes but more likely he saw it because he wanted it to be there. A cunning smile spread across the shaven-headed man's skeletal face. You do, do you? Aigner said. His voice was every bit as hateful as Kellen remembered. Well, not today. Back downstairs before I decide to teach you a lesson you won't quickly forget. I don't forget anything. Skellen moved forwards two more steps until Aigner was just beyond arm's reach. Not my wife, not my daughter... Not my friends. He touched his temple. They're all in here. Like the murdering scum you brought to my village. They're in here, burning. Ah, Sebastian Igner said, realization dawning. So you're the witch hunter, are you? I was expecting someone taller. Is this going to be a problem, Sebastian? The swordsman with the twin curved blades asked. He instinctively moved to put himself between Igner and Skellon. No. Aigner said, shaking his head. No problem at all, Posner. Our friend here was just dying. Aigner's slow smile flashed into a dangerous grin. His lips curled back on sharp teeth. You first, Skellen said, taking one step forward and slamming his fist up into Aigner's face. The glass file shattered, spilling its contents into Aigner's eyes and down his cheeks. Aigner's hands flew up to his face, slapping and clawing at the acid as it seared into his skin. Pink froth sizzled across his fingers. 
Blood ran down the backs of his hands. Scallon didn't move. Aigner staggered forwards a lumbering step. His mouth moved by the incessant violins drowned out his screams. Violent music to match Aigner's violent contortions as the acid ran into his mouth and down his throat, eating away at his flesh as it did so. He lifted his hands away from his face. Half of his right cheek was gone, dissolved in a mess of blood and bone. A rash of pustulant blisters seethed across his cheeks, chin and neck popping, sizzling and spitting as the acid continued to melt into what was left of his face. Rage burned in his one good eye. The other was gone, black and blind, where the acid had burned through it. Skellon moved quickly. He reached for the handheld crossbow at his waist, unclipped it, and leveled it squarely at Aigner's chest. You killed my wife. Death isn't good enough for you. He squeezed the trigger mechanism twice in quick succession. Two feathered shafts slammed into Aigner's chest punching him back off his feet. He sprawled across the gallery's floor, blood and gore leaking from the wounds. Arriving on the deck, Aigner gripped one of the bolts in his bloody fist and yanked it free, his face contorted with pain. Standing beside him, Herman Postner drew one of the twin blades and tossed it to Skellon. Finish him off. This isn't pretty. It shouldn't be pretty, Skellon said flatly. He stepped over Aigner's body and raised the borrowed sword. None of the others moved. It was as though a spell held them transfixed. And it shouldn't be fast. He plunged the blade into Aigner's gut, wrenching it left and right to open the wound wider, then pulled it out. That won't do it, Pastner said. Take his head off. Skellon hesitated. Do it! Suddenly, Aigner reared up, his face contorted in a mask of rage. The skin had dissolved around his cheeks and lower jaw, bearing razor-sharp fangs. His claws raked blindly towards Skellon's face. Skellon stepped sideways and back a step, bringing the sword around in a savage arc. The wickedly curved blade cut clean through the murderer's neck and spine, sending his decapitated head bouncing and spinning across the floor. There was precious little blood, considering the wound, a trickle rather than a fountain. One of the Count's men stopped it with his foot. Aigner's dead eyes stared accusingly at Skellon. For a heartbeat, Aigner's body continued to rise before it slumped to the floor, dead. The waspish violin music swarmed around them as the musicians played on, oblivious to the killing that had taken place mere feet from them. Skellon stood over the corpse of the man who had ruined his life. This final vengeance did not taste sweet. There was no satisfaction in the slaying. He looked down at the ruined face still hissing and sizzling as the acid burned away more and more of the fatty tissue. Given time, the acid would strip the head of all its soft tissue and dissolve the brain, so all that remained would be the clean white bone plates of the dead man's skull. That was personal, was it? Postner asked. Yes. And is it over now? Finished? Yes. Good. That is good. My man did wrong by you, and you claimed your justice. I can respect that, but it leaves me with a problem. How so? You killed my man. I can't let you walk away from here without recompense. I understand. And yet you aren't groveling pitifully for your life. I can respect that as well. I am not afraid to die. I came here tonight expecting to. It doesn't matter to me if I walk away from here. I have done what I set out to do. From now on, there is no purpose to my life. The sooner I die, the sooner I am reunited with my wife. Ah, so that is your story? I understand. But if I were you, I wouldn't look forward to any tear-filled reunions in the halls of the dead yet. What is your name? John Skellen. Well, John Skellen, you killed my man. As I said, this causes me a problem. And I said, kill me, Skellen said. In time. But you see... Killing you doesn't hurt you. You've said it yourself. You want to die. You are finished here. You have avenged your loved ones. So killing you doesn't give me my justice. Skellon saw Fisher lurking in the door behind Posner's shoulder. He had come up a different way to the gallery. His hand rested on the handle grip of his own short crossbow. Skellon shook his head. This wasn't what he wanted. This was about his life, not his friends. He turned as though to look over the balcony at the guests of the Count's masquerade. Posner followed the direction of his gaze. 
Oh, their time will come. But you, John Scallon, what to do with you? My instinct, I must admit, is to kill you. But as we've established, I can't do that. And beside, killing you doesn't solve the fact that I'm a man short. Just do what you want to do, and have done with it, Scallon said. Posner's curved saber slipped through his fingers and clattered to the floor. I am finished here. The music down below lapsed into momentary silence. No, you're not, Herman Posner said thoughtfully. It's just beginning. His grin revealed predatory fangs. In the lull between arrangements, with the others laughing, Posner's face shifted, his smile disappearing as his features stretched. His cheekbones lifted, and the bones beneath his face formed and reformed as though liquid. His jaw elongated, and the line of his ears sharpened as the animal beneath his skin rose to the surface. The transformation complete, Posner's roar was purely animalistic. He flew at Skellon, slapping aside his ineffectual defense, grabbed a fistful of hair and yanked his head back, exposing his neck. For a full five heartbeats, Posner held him like that, locked in a parody of a lover's embrace, before he sank his teeth into the soft ripe flesh and drank greedily. Skellon's limbs flapped for the first few seconds, fiercely as he fought for his life, and then more and more weakly as his will to live faded into oblivion. He felt himself slipping away, his sense of self fragmenting into innumerable shards, parts of his life, forgotten memories of childhood, of Lisbeth, of happiness, sadness, anger. All he could think of was, so this is death. Then he felt the warm sticky wetness in his mouth as it filled with blood his own blood and Posner's blood mingling. Sated, Posner threw his head back and howled before hurling Skellen's limp body over the balustrade and into the middle of the revels below. It took a second, and then the shrieks and the screams began. From the doorway, Fisher loosed two crossbow bolts, one fired high and wide into the ceiling of the great hall, the other embedded itself in the neck of one of Posner's men. He didn't fall. Reaching up, the man wrenched the bolt free of the wound in his neck, even as a tiny dribble of blood oozed from the gaping wound. The man snarled and dropped into a crouch, his face undergoing the same hideous transformation Posner's had moments before. Fisher turned and ran for his life. Down below, Vlad von Karstein's voice cut through the pandemonium. Ah, first blood has been drawn. Yes, yes, reveal yourselves. Let out the beast within. The festivities can truly begin. Drink! Drink the wine of humanity! From both galleries above the great hall, von Karstein's vampires leapt over the balcony and fell upon the revellers. What followed was nothing short of a slaughter.